So I did a wedding recently and the groom came to me before the wedding as he was waiting for herself to arrive, which she did eventually. And, uh, and he said, look, Father, I uh, just, uh, just wondering, like any chance I could, um, do you know, I wanted to kind of sing at the wedding. I said, right, yeah, at what stage of the wedding would you like to sing? I said, Joe, at the end, like, I uh, just wanted to sing something for herself. Um, I was okay. What is it you wanted to sing for herself? Uh, one of those Michael Bublé songs. Uh, and he said, no, I've done, I've done, I've done it a hundred times, you know, because his, his job uh, is not just DJ, but kind of DJ extraordinary. He's like a DJ crowd animator. So he's a DJ, but he sings along as well. So when he kind of gets the, you know, like, the way he described it, it was fantastic. He said, you know, I'm, I'm a DJ, but I, I don't just kind of press play. Like, I just try to get the crowd going, like, you know. <clears throat> so he sings along <clears throat> and this kind of thing as well. So I said, okay. Uh, I said, once it's at the end, yeah, once it's at the end, we, 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 we can do it as long as it's, it's appropriate and all of that. <clears throat> so he said, fine, so grand. Okay, so did the wedding, whole ceremony, all good. And then he gave me the nod, I gave him the nod, and I brought him down the mic. And uh, off you, I don't know what the song was. I'd, I'd, I'd never heard it before. It wasn't one that I knew. Uh, but it was a typical Michael Bublé song. You know, you're amazing, beautiful, can't live without you. Oh, oh, oh. whatever. You know, one of those kind of songs, you know. <clears throat> and I was listening to it going, wow, aren't all these romantic songs exactly the same? <laughs> and generally speaking, <clears throat> at some point in the song, it's going to be mentioned uh, love you with all of my heart, or my heart longs for you, or whatever it may be. That word heart is going to come into it. Uh, and as often, or as overused as it is, it's still a very effective way of trying to express to someone else what's going on in here. As in, we, we point there, why am I saying here? What can I say there? What's going on in here? <laughs> do you know? Instinctively, do you know? It's, just, it's, it's so, okay. Uh, we have a couple of things to get through today. Sacred Heart and then also the blasphemy, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. We have those two things to cover today. Okay, plus a bit of Margaret Mary Alicock, St. Margaret Mary Alicock. Okay, that's what we're trying to cover. So now you know what the, what the index is. Off we go. Margaret Mary Alicock, okay, born in, in the 17th century. Um, a wonderful, uh, uh, exceptional child um, in that even as, 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 as a small girl, like six, seven, eight years of age, she often preferred silence to play, you know? So she'd go off in, in on her own quietly and, and pray. So again, the exceptional little, little soul there. Um, so her dad died when she was relatively young and due to complications in the family, the other members of the family wouldn't release their part of the, of the assets of the, of the property back to the family. So, so Margaret grew up, uh, part of her life like, was, in, was, in, was in relative poverty, uh, plus the, all just the stress then of seeing her mom trying to fight their corner and so on and so forth. So un unpleasant, unpleasant situation. Um, when she was in her early teens, she got struck down with a uh, rheumatic fever and was lay practically paralyzed for four years. Um, I can only imagine what that's like for the family because, you know, again, uh, maybe they can give it a diagnosis, but like the cure is probably just sweat it out, kind of wait it out, rest it out. Even, even to this day, I'm not sure if things have improved much. Antibiotics, because they cover everything. Um, so four years in, 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 her, in her early teens. And she, then she made a promise to Our Lady that she would become a religious sister. And no sooner had she said the words than she was miraculously healed. Uh, and very like St. Faustina, the other way, what's, what's the expression? Eating bread is soon forgotten. You know, you make the promise, I'll be a sister. Great. <coughs> Boys. <laughs> and then, so she, again, nothing, nothing, nothing horrific here, but, but she goes out, you know, in, engaging in the social life of the time, e evening gowns or dresses or blouses or whatever they're called, and, uh, and, uh, and out she goes, and very similar to St. Faustina then, she, she sees the Lord, scourged and bloodied, uh, and he asks her very similar again to St. Faustina, how long must I wait for you? So she decides, look, this is it, I'm, I'm going to go. So she becomes the sister, in the, sister of the visitation in paris le Monial, and, um, and there, these 
visions of, of our Lord continue. Now, he reveals to her there his, his sacred heart. Uh, so again, it's a, thank God, okay, thank God it's, it's still a tradition in Irish homes. I, I hope, I hope it hasn't just become something kind of superstitious, that it's, you know, it's, it's good, it's a good look charm. Um, I hope it's considered a blessing rather than just a, a good thing to have or a nice thing to have or something that Granny always had. Um, like, whenever we have these kind of things, these kind of representations, because remember, the, these are signs that point to something greater, so that the image itself is, isn't the... Isn't, the, isn't what's important. It's pointing to the fact that I, as an individual, choose now to have the Lord's blessing. I want the Lord's blessing on my home. I want the Lord's blessing on my family. So <clears throat> the Lord then sees this intention. It's the intention, you know, the, the love. That's, what, that's what's important. And so I kind of somewhat, like our gospel says today, uh, if he, uh, I tell you, if someone openly declares himself for me in the presence of man, of the son of man will declare himself for him in the presence of the angels. So I declare myself for him by putting up this image in my house so everyone who walks in, atheist brother, agnostic sister, and everyone sees the picture of the sacred heart. But I've declared myself for men. I will declare myself for him before God's angels, Jesus says. So, so that's why there's a sign there, but the sign is pointing to something greater. Okay. And what is that sign? It's the Lord using our language. I have no idea if the Chinese say... Uh, I love you with all of my heart. And if actually, if there are any viewers out there who speak Chinese, let me know. I'm not sure if that expression exists in Chinese. Do, do the Chinese or Asians, Koreans, Japanese, do they say I love you with all of my heart or they say I love you with all of my something else? I don't know. But in all the Romance languages, French, Spanish, Italian, they're all the ones I know, kind of. Uh, in English, of course, it's I love you with all of my heart. De tout mon cœur, tout mio cuore, tout al mio corazón. All of those, all the same, same expression, right? I love you with all of my heart. Because the heart represents the, the interiority, the inside, the, the, the deepest part of a person. So now Jesus is saying, <clears throat> I expose my heart to you. you know, we even have the expression in English, I wear my heart on my sleeve. So he doesn't just wear his heart on his sleeve. If someone says, if, someone is, if, if it is said about someone, they wear their heart on their sleeve, it's generally, it's kind of negative. It means that they, they give away their heart too easily and get hurt. Whereas the Lord <coughs> reveals his heart <coughs> to us. One could even say he reveals his heart to us and then is nailed on a cross. So he cannot protect his heart. He cannot defend his heart. He cannot recover his heart. That heart remains exposed as he's nailed to the cross. And so in, in the image then of, of the sacred heart, we have the heart on fire with love, with a cross on top and a crown of thorns around it. So we have this, this profound image of love, not all roses, not all emotion, but, but action and self-sacrifice. So I love you with all of my heart, and because I love you with all of my heart, I will, I will sacrifice myself for you. I will offer myself for you. I will give myself for you. I burn with love for you, but I'm willing to be crowned with thorns, crucified for you. So this is what the, the devotion to the, to the Sacred Heart shows us, amongst many other things, but just, just to, to get to the basics of it. So the Lord revealing his heart to us, inviting us to his heart. Okay. Um, one little theological point on this, if I may. Uh, St. Margaret Mary, while she was a sister, uh, her visions were between misunderstood and considered, uh, they were either misunderstood or considered fictitious. Uh, even by, by theologians and, and, and people at the time. Uh, so obviously that's very hurtful and painful because she didn't make it up. Um, she, her story was always consistent. But <clears throat> what am I supposed to do? If you don't believe me, what am I actually supposed to do? I mean, I can't, you know, to prove that my visions are, are true, watch me levitate. You know, you know it's, you, you can't, you, you know, you just kind of have to wait until the Lord provides someone who, who sees their authenticity, which, of course, the Lord did <coughs> in her spiritual director, Saint Claude de la, de la Colombière, who uh, recognized the authenticity of her, of her uh, apparitions and approved them. And then, yeah, little by little. It took a while. It took a while for, for the, the, vision, the understanding of this devotion to spread. I think because of this theological principle that we have right so that is that if that that 
revelation, divine revelation finishes with the death of the last apostle. So St. John, when St. John died, divine revelation finished. Okay, now remember, these are, these are theological terms. So divine revelation is a very, very strict uh, period of time. So all of sacred scripture, that's divine revelation. It stops with St. John. Why? Because that's when uh, sacred scripture, when they stopped writing sacred scripture. Okay. So then you have these, then the Lord appearing to other people afterwards. What do we call that? We can't call it divine revelation because then you're saying that apparitions are the same as sacred scripture. And we can't say that. So then they come up with a term, as they need to do in theology. <coughs> they call it private revelation. Okay. Now, the difficulty with private revelation, the difficulty with that term is when you think of Fatima. Did Our Lady appear in Fatima to help three children pray more? Or was it was there a greater purpose in it? Like, was she trying to encourage the prayer of the rosary for those three children or for, for everyone? You know, was she calling them to pray more or was she calling all of us to pray more? Was the miracle of the sun for the three children or was it for, for everyone? <clears throat> when the Lord reveals his sacred heart, was that just for St. Margaret Mary or was it for, for the church? Now, theologically, as I say, it's just we, we have to be careful. We're not saying this is on par with sacred scripture, of course not. But it's also wrong to say it's only for the visionaries. If this is authentic, then God is speaking. Now, if God is speaking, then that deserves to be listened to. Again, we, we're not blurring the lines of, of theology here at all. <coughs> it's still private revelation in the sense that it's revealed to a private person and it's not on par with scripture, absolutely. Can it nourish the church? Absolutely. Divine mercy the same way. It's not, so the way we can understand it is, is divine revelation, that's kind of everything, everything is now revealed, good. But now as time moves on, we need to be kind of called back to what has already been revealed, but in a way that we understand, or you know, in, in you know, the way like, if you think of the church of the 40s and 50s uh, in Ireland here, mercy, mercy wasn't really a term, compassion. These were not terms that people would have used to describe God. But yet, look at the Old Testament, look at the New Testament, God was always merciful, God was always compassionate. So then Divine Mercy comes along to remind us of what has already been revealed. So it's not revealing anything new, but it's calling us back to what has already been revealed because it need, because we need to be called back to what has already been revealed. So just because something is, is private revelation never gives us permission to just disregard it. And that's what happens to this day. I know of people who say, ah, Divine Mercy, that's only a private revelation. Well, firstly, she's a saint in the church, so that, that gives her a little weight. Secondly, it's also a feast in the universal church, so it's not private. It's not, it can't just say it deserves no merit or attention because it's only a private revelation. Untrue, untrue. Just feast of the Sacred Heart is a <clears throat> another example. So this became, this became a feast for the whole church. This became a, a, a widespread devotion. I think people feel, people know, it's like the sense of fidelium. We know there's no contradiction or competition between the Sacred Heart and Scripture. No, of course not. Of course there isn't. You know, in fact, if anything, you know, the, the more you enter into the, like, what does, the, what does the devotion to the sacred heart ask us to do? Holy hour on Thursdays, contemplating the Lord's passion. Well, where does that draw us? Well, back to scripture. Holy communion on, on the first Fridays. Where does that draw us? Into a deep Eucharistic love, sourcing somewhat of our faith. No, there's no competition here at all. And the devotion to the, <coughs> or the celebration of the feast of the sacred heart. On the, the Friday after the second Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, again, there's no, comp this is, there's no problem here. These, all these things work together. So just we have to be careful not to disregard uh, what, what's, what's termed um, private revelation. It's still, it's still the Lord speaking. And I think it's plain obvious that what's revealed is not just for the visionary. Okay, good. Is that clear? Is that all okay? Um, okay, because I don't want to take too long. Okay, bless me. Against the Holy Spirit. What time am I at? It must be nine minutes, I'd say. Fifteen. Very sorry. Very briefly. <clears throat> Very briefly. Sins against the Holy Spirit. I've mentioned this before, but this comes up a lot. People have come to me in confession, uh, somewhat terrified, saying that, uh, you know, it says in Scripture that the sins against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. I've probably sinned against the Holy Spirit, so oh, there's nothing that can be done, really. Okay. Very, very briefly. A sin against the Holy Spirit is what? And why can't it be forgiven? What sin can't be forgiven? That makes 
not a lot of sense considering you know, the Lord himself says, he who sins you forgive, they are forgiven, he who sins you, you retain, they are retained. So he doesn't say he who sins uh, can be forgiven because because all sins can be forgiven, right? All sins can be forgiven. It's like you, you, unless you know, the only in confession, the only reason you can't be absolved is for a sin that you're not sorry for, or a sin that you intend to commit. Uh, so if you're not repentant, or you in, it's something that's going to come, you intend on, on sinning tomorrow. I can't be absolved for that, obviously. But a sin that has been done and finished. And now I'm sorry, for, why can't that be forgiven? Okay, so sin against the Holy Spirit, very brief, just to get to the answer, is a sin against God's mercy. So the Holy Spirit is what? The Holy Spirit is the personification of God's love. And God's love is merciful. It's his highest attribute, right? The highest attribute of God, of his mercy, of his love is mercy. So if I say, Lord, I don't want your mercy. Now that sin can't be forgiven because I'm refusing forgiveness see so if I sin against Annie over there and and I but I I, I, I don't want her forgiveness she says Father Patrick it's okay you didn't mean it says, no 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 I am the worst priest ever no I can't be no doesn't matter fine it's look it's fine it's fine okay and she's like no it's actually it's actually okay no 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 it look look it's grand it's look you do your thing I do mine you go your way. It's just, no. But she's not, oh, but I want to forgive. No, 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 no. It's okay. We're done. So the problem isn't God doesn't want to forgive the person. The problem is the person doesn't want God's mercy. The problem, the per, problem is the person doesn't want to be forgiven. You ever, ever heard, even in psychology, it's a very common thing, where uh, something bad happens or you do something bad, the, per, the other person forgives you, but you can't forgive yourself. So the other person has forgiven you, that, that, that reconciliation, that uh, ability, like that capacity to be reconciled is available to you, but you don't want it because you can't forgive yourself. From your side, you don't want to access that mercy. And that's the sin against the Holy Spirit. That's the sin against God's mercy. That's the sin that can't be forgiven because what you're rejecting is God's mercy. So just we have to be careful reading that, that we never think that there are some sins, kind of hidden ones that God won't tell us about that can't be forgiven. Because then we, we, we blacken God's name. We blacken our, our, the understanding of God as a loving father. And because there are these mysterious sins and no one really knows exactly what they are, but if you commit them, you can't be forgiven. Like it just, just creates fear of God. Like it's, and that's just, so just to be clear, every sin that we're sorry for, that we don't intend on committing again, firm, firm purpose of, of amendment, every sin that we're sorry for, we can be forgiven. Because God is merciful. What do we think he opens his heart for? He draws us to his heart. He doesn't protect his heart. Draws us into that relationship of love and mercy and with that I'll stop <coughs> so we ask the good Lord today through the prayers and intercession of Saint Margaret Mary Alacock to help us to understand and live in the mercy of God that we and all those around us might benefit from it Amen